Hello and welcome. I'm Professor Macbeth from William & Mary with your Unit 5 faculty lecture. This is one of my favorite parts of the course as you now have enough knowledge and understanding of the models to start using them in innovative ways, pulling new threads to develop a deeper understanding and provide fuller explanations. Today, I want to discuss one such example in this application of aggregate demand and aggregate supply and the choice of policy, or otherwise known as the activist, non-activist debate. But first, let's provide some background. When we're thinking about this topic of Unit 5 of aggregate demand, aggregate supply, monetary and fiscal policy, having both of them on the table now, and long-run stabilization, we now have this full understanding and we want to apply these concepts to the real world and real world problems. But when we're thinking about applying our textbook model to the real world, we recognize that we don't start at full employment. We don't just have one policy on the table at any time. Policymakers also don't just have one goal. In many places in the world, monetary policy and fiscal policy are not necessarily coordinated policies. They certainly aren't in the United States. And some policy actions are wrong. They bring us to a place we would not have chosen to go and now require new decisions. So we want to think about this broader context of policy action and what policymakers are doing with this idea that now there's more things on the table and also more problems on the table and how they make those adjustments. And so when we think about the conduct of monetary policy and fiscal policy, we recognize that there's a much broader list of goals of monetary and fiscal policy than we typically have thought about in this class so far. The first three are probably the ones you've spent the most time talking about, high employment or full employment, um, economic growth, price stability. We think of these as the top three and ones that we are typically focusing on, but policymakers have many other goals as well. And some of these are even legislated. So in addition to high employment, economic growth, and price stability, we also see interest rate stability, stability in financial markets, and stability in the foreign exchange market. These three are also very important when we think about, I guess, forecasting for the future. Interest rate stability is going to allow businesses as well as households to make intertemporal decisions. Stability in the financial markets is going to allow businesses to plan for the future and deal with capital markets. And stability in the foreign exchange market is going to allow our international trade to have more stability over time as well. So there's many more goals of policy, but we still only have those basic tools and of monetary and fiscal policy. And so while we have now a bigger basket of goals, we have limited tools. And so some of those goals will work together and others are gonna be in conflict with each other. And so when we're thinking about this interaction amongst the goals, the conflict is where the interesting stories lie, but to you know, lay, the, lay the path for that, there are some consistent goals, and we know that already with what we've done. And typically the consistent goals are ones that we think of as pairwise. The previous slide I had a list of six goals, and now I'm just looking at two at a time. And in pairwise goals, we can frequently pick pairs of goals that will work together. The first one, low unemployment and economic growth. Well, in a, in a society, where we have population growth, we want to have economic growth so that we have you know, rising employment opportunities for our rising population that will then result in low unemployment. So low unemployment with economic growth, those goals go together or are consistent. The second pairwise goal that I have here, interest rate stability with financial market stability. These goals go together. They are dealing with financial goals, and interest rate stability means that we're thinking that interest rates will stay fairly constant into the future, allows businesses to make decisions about their investments, their investments in capital um, growth for their uh, firms that are going to allow financial market stability to work hand in hand. And so what we have here as well are sort of like real goals and goals that are more nominal or transitory in, in, in feature. And so those goals are consistent with each other in this pairwise um, grouping. That said, the previous slide had six goals. And so when I think about having a bigger basket of goals, in this case, I have um, three goals, price stability and interest rate stability and high employment. 
in the short run, I'm gonna to have to make some choices. I'm gonna to have to decide which is going to be more important to me in the short run. In the short run here is important because why we have several goals that we're going to want to achieve is that we don't have the goals all together right now. We're not at a long run equilibrium. And so we have a set of goals that we're trying to balance in this short run return to full employment. And so it, an example that is an inconsistent set of goals, price stability and interest rate stability and high employment in the short run. Inconsistent, and we have to pick a, a, a thread to pull here, but we're thinking about monetary policy and we're thinking about what monetary policy can do. We can either think of there being expansionary monetary policy or contractionary monetary policy, different ways to get around that, but those are the basic ideas. And so when we're thinking about having these three things together, price stability, interest rate stability, and high employment in the short run, we're gonna to have to think about this. The um, piece at the bottom here, we have income increasing, this high employment in the short run, unemployment will be decreasing. But as we have this expanding economy, this is going to be putting upward pressure on both prices and real interest rates. And so, if we think about engaging in policy with what the Federal Reserve can do here in, in the United States, we could have, say, an increase in the money supply to curb the increasing interest rates, but that's going to exacerbate the prices, the price inflation. Alternatively, the Federal Reserve could have contractionary monetary policy that would curb the upward pressure on prices, but it would make real interest rates higher. And so there's a trade-off between those two goals when we're thinking about having this bigger basket of goals on the table. In addition, when we think about the conduct of monetary policy and fiscal policy, we now not only have a long list of goals, we have ideas of having goals that are consistent with each other and goals that are inconsistent with each other. We also recognize that when we're actually thinking about forecasting, actually thinking about the magnitudes of policies and where we want to go, that we also have issues of lags and uncertainty. Lags are threefold, a recognition lag, a policy lag, and an outsider implementation lag. The recognition lag being the time between when an event happens in the economy and we recognize that it has happened. And we consider the recognition lag to be equivalent between monetary and fiscal policy. Everyone can get up and read for me, the Wall Street Journal in the morning, and you recognize that something has happened in the financial markets or you recognize that something has happened in the labor markets or something like that. The policy lag is a time between when you recognize that there's been an event and you decide to engage in policy or not, as we'll talk about as we move forward here. And then the outside lag or the implementation lag is the time between when you say you're having a policy and you implement that. For monetary policy, in many places, that's fairly quick. For fiscal policy, that can be fairly long, depending on how um, well the Finance, the government system works. But we have these lags. And so when we're thinking about policy, we recognize that in the bigger picture now, when many things are happening and we're not at full employment to start, that we potentially had policy actions a month or two ago, and now we're seeing new things happening and we need to realize, do we need to have more policy? Or have, have we put out policy to look at those issues already? And that deals with this final piece before we get to the main part of today's lecture, but the final piece being the uncertainty piece. So in any given day, when we wake up and we look at the newspaper and we actually say, oh, there's been this event happening, there is still uncertainty about the present state of the economy. We, are act, we act very boldly when we're talking about our policies, even when we get to this point in this course where we're saying we're going to develop these broader models and think about things more broadly, but we do have uncertainty about the present state of the economy. On the first Friday of every month, we have our jobs report put out and we all talk about it, at least those of us in economics do. Uh, we all talk about the current state of unemployment, the job losses, the job gains, whatever it may be in any given part of our economic cycle. But the next month when the new jobs report comes out, that new jobs report modifies the one that came out the previous month. And so while we have some boldness about the current state of the economy, we also have to recognize humbly that that is our first best guess of where we are and that those numbers are going to be readjusted for months into the future. 
We also recognize that there's uncertainty about the timing of monetary and fiscal policies, that outside lag on the previous slide, that we had policies last month, three months ago, six months ago, have those policies actually come forward and worked on the economy, or are they still working their way through the system? And so there's uncertainty about how much we might need to do, given our current conditions, given the fact that we did things before. And then the final piece of uncertainty, I think of is the fact that we're trying to actually get to some point on the horizon. We want to get to this point over here at that, you know, in the horizon, we're trying to get back to that long run position. We have uncertainty about where we stand today. We have uncertainty about where we're, what's in the pipeline already with regard to policy. So there's uncertainty about how much we need to do to get to that final point. And so this estimation error of these future variables. So I need to plan for the future, but the future is moving forward with me as I'm actually doing that. And so this preamble here to our main piece of today's talk is really just to recognize that when we have this nice compact model and we're applying it to very discrete little stories, that's great. But when we think about using it more broadly, we have to recognize that there's many more things that are on the table, more goals of policy, policies that are consistent and inconsistent, and then the sort of technical aspects of lags and uncertainty, estimation errors and things like that. But policymakers have to put all that together when they try to decide whether or not we're going to have policy. And so we see that there are lots of goals and lots of problems. And how can we sort out what to do? What choices do we make? Well, one discussion, not the only discussion, but one discussion is not whether we have monetary or fiscal policy, but do we have policy at all? And when I say that, do we have policy at all? We're really saying, do we have discretionary policy? Do we have these reactionary policies when we see these problems in the economy, when we see these news reports that are saying that there are problems? And this is a nice story, a nice uh, model of its own. This argument is dependent upon market clearing and flexibility of prices. So this is not a discussion of, I like monetary policy, you like fiscal policy, and we're gonna have that argument. We're saying, do we have discretionary policy, discretionary monetary policy or fiscal policy, depending upon other market factors? And so the argument is dependent upon market clearing and the flexibility of prices. Is the economy set up with policies that will aid us to getting back to full employment? in that long run. So that when there is a shock to the economy, does the economy move back to full employment or does the economy languish in unemployment or does the economy languish in high inflationary periods? Um, and so how do we move back? And so that final piece there, the number four, dealing with market clearing and flexibility of prices takes us one step away from the monetary fiscal policy argument that we spend so much time in, in, in intro macro. And this is something that is really the focus of what I wanted to talk about today, is this activist, non-activist debate. This is a, a debate about discretionary policy, broadly writ. Non-activists believe in establishing policies with automatic stabilizers and allow market clearing to re resolve this equilibrium. While activists believe in discretionary policies due to prices that are slow to change and especially slow to change downward. And we'll pull that thread a little bit. But before we go to what are some hand-drawn uh, graphs of mine, I just want to spend another minute talking about the difference between activists and non-activists. So non-activists believe in establishing policies. And that's a key feature that my students frequently think, oh, the non-activists are like the do-nothings. They just don't believe in having active, you know, policies to help correct the economy. And that's not it at all. Non-activists believe in discernment, I think is maybe a better way of thinking about this. They, they believe in establishing complex policies so that as the economy goes through different business cycles, different political cycles, that the economic structures are there to accommodate that. And having gone through a discernment process of establishing policies that are complex, when they see that their policies may not actually be working, 
they are willing to adjust those policies, but they do so again through thinking about what's actually happening, thinking about how to change that more complex system, not simply saying problem, have a policy, problem, do this other policy. So non-activists are policy makers. They just believe in developing a much broader structured policy. And I'm sure that in your classes, you've talked about some of these things. Some of, the, some of these kinds of policies are things such as unemployment insurance or progressive taxes or things like that. So that we have these kinds of policies already in play. When we're thinking about dividing the marketplace of policymakers into these two camps, non-activists are not the do-nothings, but they actually believe in having complex policies and then letting those policies work, having faith that the policies you develop were in fact good policies and are going to help. Activists believe that that's great to have these complex policies, but when we have shocks to the economy, that we actually need to have discretionary policies because prices are slow to change and prices are slow to change so that the market clearing mechanisms that in our standard average demand average supply model, which would mean the short run average supply curve would move to clear the economy, that those things don't happen, especially downward. And so if we are thinking about having a policy and we're in a recession, we need to engage in activity because the closure is going to be long and painful and that would create a prolonged recession. So activists believe we need to do something, engage in policies because prices are slow and especially slow to change downward. They think that prices are, can be pretty quick in the upward direction, which is part of what supports their argument and I'll show that you that on another slide. But this is the two, the two, I guess, distinctions to keep track of. This is not a discussion of whether I use monetary policy or fiscal policy. This is a discussion of do I engage in policy. And so here is our first slide, um, looking at the activist, non-activist policy. And it's a policy of do I engage in policy or not? And when I think about this, I'm starting at point A here at income level of Y1, price level of P1. I'm in a recessionary gap, something that we are all very well familiar with. And we have the two resolutions, A to B, A to C. In our standard average supplier demand model, if we were to be at a recessionary gap like this, perhaps the average demand curve had shifted back, then we'd say, well, over time, input prices would go down and the short average supply curve would go go out to the right and we move from A down to C. A to C is the non-activist position. But some of the words that I just used that over time the short negative supply curve would go down as input prices are renegotiated at lower levels, the non-activists believe in market clearing. They believe that prices are flexible and that when you present yourself with a an event like being at A, that the movement from A to C will happen relatively quickly. Now that's an important piece for their argument because the timing of the movement from A to C, if it happens quickly, then we have prices going down, we have output returning to full employment, but the recession, every quarter, every month that you're not at Y star, you're in a recession. And so as long as you're in a recession, there's, you know, pain and uncertainty in the economy. And so if A to C takes a long time, that's not a good closure. Non-activists believe market clearing. And so they believe prices will adjust fairly quickly. And so you go from A to C and you have resolved the situation. Activists, however, believe A to C will be prolonged. They believe that will take a long time that you are not wanting to take a cut in salary. And so you will sit on your hands until you can maybe find a better job that pays you what you previously earned. That's a, that's a difficult argument for economists to make, but that's part of the story. And so they believe that by having discretionary policy, I'm gonna go in between some slides we go through here. Um, so backing myself up here. So A to C, this is the non-activist outcome, that you'll be able to move from A to C with the short average supply curve moving down 
establishing a new equilibrium at a lower price level, P2, and back at full employment, and that this will occur fairly quickly and there is not this prolonged recession. This varies from what the activists believe. The activists believe that we will move from A to B through discretionary policy. The, AD, the average demand curve is moving from AD to AD2. And I'm not annotating this as due to a government policy or due to a monetary policy, because that's not the argument here. It's that you engage in an active policy. The activists believe that A to B can occur and can occur quickly. And this speed of price adjustment is really the nuance of this whole uh, argument. While activists believe the movement from A to C, as we saw in the previous diagram, would be slow because you are not wanting to take a pay cut to uh, input the inputs to um, production input prices go down slowly, but input prices can go up quickly is that what they're thinking here. And so A to D, A to B, aggregate demand two, can occur quickly. And so yes, you have inflation, because you're going from A to B, price level is gonna be higher, you get back to Y star without having a prolonged recession. Now, this part of the argument is an interesting part. Because when we think about, I'm gonna go back to the previous slides. When we think about the movement from A to C, that we have lower prices and full employment, that's our standard thought that we have everyone sort of at the end of the day better off. We have lower prices, lower rates of inflation as we apply this to a more modern model and we're back at full employment. When we go out to the activist policy, we have, a round of inflation, getting back to that same point. And that brings a whole separate story about the whole issue of the effects of inflation. And part of the activist regime, part of the activist philosophy, why this makes sense to them, is that differential of prices go down slowly, but they can go up quickly. And part of the problem with inflation is when we have differential rates of inflation, whether the inflation rate is at 2% or 4%, we get adjusted to that and there's no relative price differences. But as we move from a rate of two, uh, an inflation rate of 2% to an inflation rate of 4%, and inflation is higher and lower in different parts of the economy and for different wage earners, that differential rate of inflation is where we have the problem. Now, differential rates of inflation may be something that you have not thought about before. But when I teach this in my class, I talk about the activist policy, this movement from A to B, as sort of the Gulliver's Travels uh, movement in um, economics. And so when we think about Gulliver's Travels, Jonathan Swift, and so great liberal arts uh, analogy here, is that Gulliver is either, wakes up one morning and he's twice the size of everybody else, right? And so the problem with Gulliver is that relatively, he's really large and everyone else is really small, or the other parts of Gulliver's Travels. The Gulliver's Travel analogy for me on this is that if prices are to jump, then it would be the equivalent of that if we were all to wake up the next morning and be twice our size, and so those of us who are five feet tall are now 10, and those of us who are six feet tall are now 12, but we are all double the size, and relatively, we are to each other relatively the same size, and so we are no better or worse off, we're no taller or shorter than we were the day before. We are relatively the same. And so this jump in prices is the same. If all prices were to jump, which is what the activists believe, that prices can go up quickly, then relative prices are unchanged, and so there is none of that differential impact, differential hurt uh, associated with inflation that we see in the marketplace. So putting this together, we see the full activist, non-activist discussion here. Starting at A, the non-activists believe we should allow the market to clear, which means the short and average supply curve will go down to a lower price input and resolve ourselves at C. The activists believe we would take a long time to do that and we would have that very painful resolution of the recession. And so we can jump A to B quickly, 
yes, we have inflation, but it happens quickly and the relative inflation is not, um, is resolved. And so we have this discussion of how do we get back to full employment, A to B, A to C, whether you're a non-activist or an activist. And as with most nice textbook models, this seems like it plays itself, itself out very neatly. What is the part that the activist, non-activist debate doesn't address is the fact that while we have these resolutions that we've just talked about, there's this other piece over here. And this is a piece that relates back to one of my primary comments. There are sometimes bad policies, choices that we made that put us to places we didn't choose to go. And this is going to give us new problems to work out. So just looking at those two points, and since I switched slides, I'm gonna go back to that other one again. The activist, non-activist debate in its direct positive is talking about from that recessionary gap, do we choose to have the quote unquote natural or non-activist closure, or do we decide to do, do something and have the activist closure? But there's this other intersection over here. And so just looking at those two intersections now, where we started with the recessionary gap, and then this final piece, which is the place that no one in our previous argument claims, it's not the activist solution, it's not the non-activist solution, but it's there. So what's the deal there? Well, the deal is that we had activist policy, but the non-activists were correct. So how do we get to that point? So from our recessionary gap, the activists had policy because look, there's this new aggregate demand curve. They decided to do something to get us back up and close that recessionary gap. However, as the activists were engaging in policy, the policies of the non-activists, complex policies that provide automatic stabilizers to the economy, those policies were there. They've always been there. And those policies were working. And so the lowering of input prices and the increase of that short run aggregate supply curve getting us back to full employment was working as the activists were coming up with their discretionary policy. And so activist policy, because indeed the aggregate demand curve shifted, but the non-activists were correct because the short run aggregate supply curve expanded out. And so A to D is one of those scenarios where a bad policy was chosen. The activists should have said, we don't need to do something. The market behaviors are such that we're gonna close this without us doing anything. The activists couldn't sit on their hands long enough to have that happen. They engaged in policy. And this is a scenario where we have gone from a recessionary gap to an inflationary gap. Or from the policymakers' perspective, we've gone from one set of problems to another set of problems. And now we need to think about what we do next. We haven't solved the problem. We've just given ourselves another new, not an equilibrium place to be. Okay, so now that we have the storyline of the previous slide, just looking at that one last time, where we recognize that we have this additional place where action happened when the non-activists were correct, and so we basically are trading one set of policies for another. This analysis can be applied to many economic eras over the past 40 years. What I personally think of as the modern economic history, um, but is the history of my being engaged in economics and my teaching here at William & Mary. But I have sort of six areas here that can be used to apply this model. First one I usually think of is from the late 70s to the late 80s. This is really focused around the 1980 presidential cycle between Carter and Reagan. Um, Paul Volcker becomes chair of the Federal Reserve in the late 1970s. Carter and Reagan are vying in 1980 for the presidential cycle. Reagan wins that election. And so through the course of the, most of the 1980s, we have a Reagan versus Volcker story between Reagan wanting to have expansionary fiscal policies and Volcker really re renovating, revising what the Federal Reserve does with regard to its policies. The next era that I see is basically the next seven or eight years that follow, where we have 
President Bush, first President Bush versus Greenspan now as chair of the Federal Reserve. Then as we get into the middle 1990s, um, we have several rounds of competing policies between still Greenspan, who has a very long term as chair of the Federal Reserve, and Congress. These are based on problems that are associated with Congress because of full employment budget reduction guidelines that come out of the Reagan and Bush era. Moving forward, I see this, this model as being able to be used at the 2000s with the Japanese banking crisis. So it, stepping away from just simply Federal Reserve versus the executive, being the president, the Federal Reserve versus Congress. But we can think about this as a trade-off between domestic policy and international policy. We can move forward to 2008 with the Great Recession and the stimulus package. So a huge shock to the economy, a huge loss of wealth in the economy and the stimulus packages at both the federal level and the um, Federal Reserve level that come out. And then finally, what I do challenge my own students to do is what to do with today's events. How do the events that you read about today in the newspaper or see in a podcast, hear in a podcast or see on television, how can you describe them with the models that we have? I mean, the aggregate demand, aggregate supply model is a fairly simple model. We haven't expanded that much upon it today. We've just been trying to look at it from a slightly different lens. So when you're thinking about policy that you're hearing about in the news of the day, how does that layer on what has already happened and where do you think that's going to get us? And so the final example I wanted to uh, address was just to take that first item and look at that presidential cycle of 1980, um, Reagan wins and Volcker coming into office. And so I see this as this start at 79, which is the presidential cycle. I mean, presidential cycles in terms of the rhetoric that happens typically takes a year or two. And this is a period between 79 and 1987. Now this graph is not clearly that nice little diamond around Y star that we looked at three, four slides ago now. We start at a point where we have high inflation and low employment, or we have unemployment and inflation or stagflation, and that we wind up with a scenario where we have non-activist policies um, enacted by the Federal Reserve, a real change in policy focus from what had been the focus of Federal Reserve policy from the 60s, 50s, 60s, up to the late 1970s. So Paul Volcker establishes a very non-activist policy with the money supply growth rate rule for the Federal Reserve. That relates to a expansion in the short angle supply curve as inflationary expectations change over time. And so lower inflationary expectations are going to shift out the short and aggregate supply curve. At the same time, from the federal government side, both the executive, the president, and Congress, in reaction to this recession, we have huge increases in government spending, changes in tax policy, changes in business um, regulation, that allows there to be a large increase in arrogant demand over this time. And so we have an expansion on the demand side and expansion on the supply side. And so this is the activist policy when the non-activists are correct. We go from one set of problems to a different set of problems. But we still, have, and so part of the discussion here, it's not a nice neat graph. It is a graph where lots of things are happening, but if we track the economy over this nearly decade of time, we do have this idea that we are expanding at lower rates of inflation over time. And at 87, people definitely do feel a lot better than they did in 79. They have had full employment, they've had good jobs, we've had lower prices. They feel pretty good, but from an economist's perspective, we have traded one set of problems to another. We are now way beyond full employment. We are at a point that is not sustainable. And so the new policymakers, in 87 and moving now into the 88 presidential cycle. So President Bush and Greenspan will be the people who are in charge now. They're gonna to have to try to figure out how to go from this point back over to full employment without this feeling like a large recession. We are gonna to need to be able to slow down in some way that doesn't make everyone feel we're returning to 
a previous era of inflation and unemployment. And so in thinking about this policy, you probably would be happier to be a policymaker over here than you were over here. But now just thinking about this from the economist perspective, the activist, non-activist debate, when you activists engage in policy, but the non-activists are correct, you are simply trading one set of policies for another set of, or one set of problems for another set of problems that are going to need to have new policies associated with them. So I just wanted to leave you with that. I thank you for listening to this Unit 5 faculty lecture. I hope that you take away a few things to think about and apply to your models that you've learned and apply to your reading of newspapers and listening to the news as you realize how economics is part of your everyday life. Thank you. Goodbye.